So we're going to be talking about identifying and designing well, de well designed experiments. There are several conditions that we have to have to have a well designed experiment, and you cannot consider the result valid from an experiment unless it is well designed. So, y'all probably done some experiments and stuff before in your science classes. These are going to be a little bit different. Um, depending on their context. So just like a couple of the highlights from the vocabulary. Treatment, response variables, which are pretty simple. Um, you just have to be careful with response variables. You have to interpret what you're actually trying to measure. It's not necessarily specifically the, um, if they're giving a pill, the response variable may or may not be the results from that. It just depends on how the uh, random assignments. Okay, we have to be very, very careful with random assignments. It really, truly does have to be random. You can't just pick this group of people or pick this group of objects. You have to make sure it's completely random. Uh, comparison or control group. It just depends on what you're talking about. There's a slight difference between the two. A comparison group is when you have two sets of groups and you, you give one treatment to one group and a different treatment to another group. That's a comparison. A control group is when you give a treatment to one group and you don't give a treatment to another group. Okay, so comparison, you have two treatments. Control is when you only have one group. And a lot of times that control group will be receiving what we call a placebo, which is kind of like a trick. I mean, we're not trying to trick people, but uh, if you've ever heard of the placebo effect, what that means is some people, there, you, it's amazing how strong your uh, psychological mind can be because some people can convince themselves that they're getting better just because they're taking a pill, whether or not that pill actually has something that's making them better or not. Um, so that's why a lot of times with medical studies, they will have a placebo uh, uh, treatment so it looks like they're getting the treatment that the other group is getting, but there's not actually any medicine or uh, something else in that treatment that they're receiving. They just think they're getting it so that they're taking away um, that variable of possibly people just convincing themselves that they're getting better. Subject blind. It does not mean that the subject is physically blind. It just means they don't know what they're getting. They could be getting that placebo, they could be getting the actual treatment. Same thing with the evaluator. We don't have blind evaluators, they just don't know what the subject is receiving. And if both those are true, then you have what we call a double blind study. That's typically preferable for it to be double blind so that the uh, subject doesn't know and then the evaluator also doesn't know. You may say, well, why does it matter if the evaluator knows? Well, sometimes it, it may bias their reports if they know that this group is getting the treatment and this group is not getting the treatment. <clears throat> and the lurking variable, we're going to talk about those a little bit today. Those can help explain some results, but it's not necessarily what you were trying to test or measure or study. Uh, so we'll see how that comes into play here in a minute. All right, let's go through this first experiment. We're going to kind of talk through it together as a group. And then I'm going to let you look at some more examples of work you're doing yourselves. Here's a common science experiment that tries to determine if mung bean, I don't know what a mung bean is, but apparently it's some kind of bean that sprouts, um, whether if we put them in a microwave and give them a gen, I'm not sure what a gentle zap is, if that's what a biotech is, I don't know. But anyway, it's a gentle zap in the microwave. We want to find out if they are more likely to sprout than the ones that are not put in the microwave. Um, so, what is our treatment here? What's the treatment in this experiment? The microwave. Putting in the microwave. Zapping the microwave. Okay, so what's the response variable? What are we trying to measure? Did it sprout? Very simple question. Did it sprout? We're not measuring how high it grew. We just want to know, did it sprout? Did it start growing? Okay, so here's one scenario. 
Carlos, I didn't know you were a statistician. Um, we've got 10 milking seats and eight of those sprouted. Why should Carlos not conclude that the ones that are zapped in my are more likely to sprout than if they're not been zapped? Hmm? Okay, two of them didn't sprout. Yeah, he doesn't know what happens if they're not zapped. He zapped all of them. He doesn't have um, the control group. Okay, he doesn't have the control group. So um, we'll put that as our reason right there. Missing the control group. You gotta have something to compare it to. Even though the probability was high here, they may have sprouted regardless. Okay, let's look at another scenario. We've got Mia, she took 20 of these seeds. She picked out 10 that looked healthy and put them in the microwave. Uh, of those 10, eight of them sprouted. Of the 10 that were not put in the microwave, three of them sprouted. Can you explain why this is not a good conclusion either? They got the healthy ones. That's totally not fair. Okay, so this was not random. Uh, we could also consider it a lurking variable. Um, the fact that the healthier ones, oh they're probably more likely to sprout because they're healthier. If they don't look healthy, then they're probably not going to sprout. I don't know if you plant seeds, but it's kind of obvious sometimes. Okay, let's do another one. Julia used four seeds. Selected two at random and to zap them and did not zap the other two. Both that were zapped sprouted, and the two that didn't that weren't zapped did not sprout. Why is this not a the numbers are not enough? It's not enough polar. It's not very good. I mean two and two. That's not a lot to go on. I mean, you got like a 50-50 chance anyways. Um, so uh, we'll just say insufficient numbers. Okay, so take a second there. We've got three scenarios, each had a flaw in them. Take a second to talk in your group and come up with a good idea for an experiment that could provide uh, but the three keys to a well-designed experiment, you have to have these three characteristics. Number one, you have to have random assignments. You have to have random assignments. You cannot have any true influence on which treatment gets assigned to which subject. You have to have a sufficient number of subjects. Now, this is where there's kind of a gray area. You know, well, what is a sufficient number of subjects? Well, it depends on what you're trying to draw a conclusion about. If you're trying to draw a conclusion about, let's say, our entire school, and we've got about 800 and some students, then probably a sufficient number would be like at least 100. You want to have a good variety of people. Um, but, you know, if you're just wanting to draw some conclusions about everybody on this call, then you could probably randomly select about 20 or so. So it kind of depends on the population you're trying to represent. Um, and then the last one is you have to have that comparison or control group. It just depends on whether you're comparing two treatments or if you're trying to determine the um, effectiveness of one treatment. Okay, so we already talked about part A there, which characteristics <coughs> were missing. We really already talked about those. One was missing. Random assignment, one was missing control group, and one was missing a sufficient number. Um, we, we're not going to talk about B because we didn't do the team stacking experiments. What can go wrong if treatments are not assigned randomly to the subjects? What do y'all think can go wrong when you don't assign them randomly? Bias. Okay, a lot of bias. Uh, whether it's bias on your part or, or whatever, uh, you're going to run into issues with bias and that's going to throw your results off. Okay, working variables. Working variables can sometimes be a little difficult to pick up on. The key to determining a lurking variable, in my opinion, is to think of 
well, what else could be causing this result? Right? What else could be causing this result besides the actual treatment itself? So I want you to read example six there, part A. Read that. Try and answer the questions uh, following it, and then we'll talk about it together. Okay, so what are our treatments here? What's the treatment? The medicine kit. Okay, the medicine kit is the treatment. Either getting it or not getting it. You want? That would be, that would just be a treatment for the, what they're getting from the doctor. But what we're actually trying to determine is if the medicine kit changes things. Uh, so what's the response variable? How are we deciding if it works or not? If they fill the prescription or not. Okay, so why is this not a well-designed experiment? Okay, that could have something to do with it. Okay, let's think about the three characteristics we have to have. We've got to have a comparison or control group. Do we have that? Yes. Do we have a sufficient number of uh, subjects? Yeah, we got 11,000. Do we have random assignment? No. Okay, now you may argue that the five clinics may be random and the other five clinics may not be random, uh, but if you're giving all the patients in these five clinics the kit and all the patients in these five clinics you don't get the kit, it's not truly random. Okay, you're missing the random assignment. Um, so what could we do to improve that? Yeah, just spread it out amongst all 10 clinics. Spread the distribution out amongst the 10 clinics. Randomly assign it, you know, say every third patient or every fifth patient or something like that. Okay, uh, now there was a question number three at the top of the next page. It says, what lurking variable might account for the difference in response? Can anybody think of a lurking variable in this scenario? What might explain? Any thoughts? Okay, could just be the people. She said something about clean hands, it could just be the people. I mean, and that's what I was gonna say. I was gonna say it's the population, think about the population of people. This could be five clinics in the inner city and five clinics in a suburban area. You're talking about two different total populations of people that view medicine differently uh, because of the conditions that they live in. So, um, just the, I, I would say the population. You don't know where these clinics are. That's probably the lurking variable uh, going on there. So that's something to think of. Okay, let's look at the next one. Or y'all look at it, y'all can read. Read example B and answer similar questions about one, one two, and three. Okay, 